Hi, my name is Thaddeus Aid. Um, most people just call me Thad, and I am about to do my practice run for my course this evening, which is Introduction to Perl. Um, it's being hosted by the University of Oxford's IT Learning Program. Um, I myself am a member of the Department of Statistics and the Life Sciences Interface Doctoral Training Center. Um, I'm a Doctor of Philosophy student. I am studying positive Darwinian selection in Homo sapiens. Uh, but my background is in IT and computer science. My undergraduate degree is in computer science, which is why I'm here. Um, if you've got any questions about the course, my email is there. Um, and at the website below that, you will find the course booklet, these lecture slides, and the supplemental material for the course. Um, the course was originally created by Christopher Yao of the Stats Department, and then it was taken over by Sebastian Kelm of the Stats Department, and now it's mine. So, um, if you were here at the, uh, the actual sessions that I'm practicing for, uh, it's done in three nights over three weeks. Um, each session is three hours. Um, so, realistically, um, if you put nine hours into this, um, you should get most of what you would get if you're actually here. Um, I'll be covering basic programming concepts, nothing too advanced. Um, I'll be covering Perl syntax um, and sort of uh, focusing on how to deal with data files because most of the people that I'm teaching here are researchers. Um, so they need to be able to, um, I think most people are here to be able to um, analyze the data from their research or to be able to um, gather data from web forms and whatnot. Um, one of my other goals is to provide a mechanism for you to go and learn more about Perl by yourself because um, it doesn't really do you much good if you have to keep coming back to your teacher um, if, for everything you have to do. So if you can go off and learn about programming languages by yourself, that, that is much to be preferred. And if you're in the class, um, I will be helping uh, provide ideas on how to tackle these specific problems that brought people to the class. Um, as here, as at home, uh, please go at your own pace. I mean, don't rush it, take your time. Um, try and understand everything as you go. Um, I will not be teaching everything there is to know about Perl. I don't know everything there is to know about Perl, so I think that's a bit of a um, tautological truth there. Um, I will not be teaching advanced concepts of programming or Perl programming in specific. I won't be touching things like object-oriented programming. I won't be dealing with data flow. I won't be dealing with web programming. I won't be going into application-specific tricks. I won't be going into other um, topics such as um, time complexity. Um, and I won't be going into the strict technical details about Perl. This is just an introduction. If you want to learn more, there, is, there are hundreds of sources on the web that you can go uh, read or listen to on YouTube. Um, so Perl is a high-level language. And what that means is that there's a strong abstraction from the details of the computer. Um, so the original um, languages like binary and assembly and um, well binary and assembly they, they were very close to what the hardware actually hardware actually does when you program something so um, it would actually have the binary or assembly codes for um, variable one and variable two and then add the two together where as as we abstract away from the hardware we can start to use more natural language elements, um, and it becomes a little bit easier to understand at the cost of uh, a little bit of speed and a little bit of complexity. Uh, Perl is general purpose. Um, there's a great quote that Perl is the Swiss army chainsaw of programming languages. Um, pretty much, if, you, if it can be done with a computer, it can be done with uh, Perl, um, with the caveat that it is an interpreted language. Um, so what interpreted means is that you've just got this, the program file itself, which is just a text file, and then um, the Perl, prog or the Perl itself will then take that text file and turn it into a program to be run on the spot um, as needed. This means that Perl is very easy to modify, because all you have to do is go into your source file and modify whatever you want to do before you run it, and it will do it without having to recompile beforehand. Um, it also means that you can move from 
platform to platform, so you can write a Perl script on a Windows machine, run it on a Linux machine, and it should run um, fairly okay unless you've got something very specific um, that requires the Windows um, operating system to perform. Um, and this is what I'm talking about by uh, dynamic is um, that Perl executes, um, Perl does at runtime what many other languages do during compilation. Like uh, if you were in C or C++, uh, it will do a lot of a lot of these structures before you run the code, where Perl does it at the time of execution. Um, so Perl is used a lot for text processing. Um, in my background as an IT guy, uh, we used Perl quite a lot to automate um, system administration tasks and make things easier for us as administrators. Um, so historically, also Perl has been very involved in web programming. Um, much of the old CGI um, web interfaces were done in Perl. Um, currently, what I mostly use it for is sort of the science, scientific aspects of data processing. Um, when I need something quick and adaptable, I will use Perl over Java, which is my probably my main language. Um, there is a library repository called CPAN um, that has a great many extensions for Perl that, you, that I'll give you the address for at the end of the course, and you can go there, uh, find more tutorials, and find out what everybody else has done with this language. So alternatives to Perl, because Perl is not the best, um, not the best language for everything. It's very good for what it does, um, but if you want to do specifically scientific computing, especially um, uh, matrix algebra or statistics, um, R and MATLAB are um, your uh, choices. There, um, I'm not sure what Octave is. I've never run across that. Um, that's a uh, from the previous um, uh, teachers. Um, SciPy is a uh, another um, mathematical scientific computing language. Um, Python is uh, a very similar language to Perl and is becoming very popular, uh, especially within scientific communities, as I understand it. Um, I'm more into the compiled languages myself, although the one I use is a just-in-time compiler, which kind of brings the benefits of an interpreted language like Perl and the speed of a compiled language like C. Um, so the Three sessions in the classroom are probably going to be broken up into six or seven YouTube videos. So I think for this one, we're going to be doing our first Perl program and variables, um, which are the scalars and the arrays, and then we'll take a break. Um, so what you need to do a program um, is that you need a source, a source file uh, for your source code, um, which will be named something like myprogram.pl. .pl is the standard um, extension for Perl um, files, so um, many other files will uh, reference that and to know that it's a Perl uh, program. You need the Perl, Perl interpreter, which is available at www.perl.org. Um, you can choose several different varieties there. If there's any data that you need, for your uh, program, you'll need that as well. Um, and to run your program, it's simply type, you type Perl, you type the name of your script, and you hit enter. Um, no binaries, no executables. Um, it's very portable, it's very lightweight, um, and you can go like that. So this is the classic first program. Um, it's called Hello World, and it shows sort of what the very sort of basic how to get the program up and running is um, at the top. It, that's an instruction. That's instructions to the operating system to where you can find the Perl interpreter. Um, this is um, for a Linux machine. Um, the next two lines are pragmas. Pragmas are direct instructions to the interpreter itself. Um, this is telling um, the uh, interpreter to use the strict and warnings instructions, which I'll explain in a couple of minutes. Um, then down at the bottom is print, uh, print hello world. Um, and what happens for this is um, that 
once we hit the run button, it's just going to come down here and print what was in the double quotes. Um, the backslash n at the end uh, is just telling the computer to put a new line at the end of the um, at the end of the output. So there are two basic types of variables within Perl. There's a third one that we'll talk about later called the hash table. Um, but I want to start with scalars. A scalar is just a simple thing. It, it's, it's, um, it's logically one thing. It can be made up of multiple letters. It can be made up of multiple, well, not really multiple numbers. But it can be um, uh, integers. It can be um, real numbers. It can be negative numbers. It can be um, anything on the real number scale. Uh, it can also be a string, um, which is just a string of characters that are um, in close and double quotes. Um, and then to print it out, you just put the, the name of the, um, the variable inside your double quotes, and it will go ahead and do that for you. And here we go. So it's just um, come out and just said, um, here are the numbers that I put in. Here's the, the string that I put in, um, very simply. So being strict. So strict makes you think a little bit more about how you code things. If you're not strict, you can declare a new variable pretty much any time that you would like. But that does mean you can have problems where you misspell a variable. Um, and the compiler won't yell, or the interpreter won't yell at you because it just thinks that it's a new variable. Um, and that required, and then it will just introduce bugs into your code. So by using strict, it requires that you use the, the my um, prefix to your new variables to, to signify that you actually want this new variable to exist within your program. So that way, if you mistype it later, um, the interpreter will yell at you and say, uh, this, this is wrong. So this also leads into something called scope, which I will cover later. Um, um, so numbers can be modified in the standard mathematical styles, addition, subtraction, um, multiplication, division. Uh, modulo is remainder mathematics. Um, so if, like here, um, if we have 8 modulo 5, um, so that's 8 divided by 5, and you have a remainder of 3. And then exponent, um, most languages require the use of uh, a power um, subroutine, uh, which I'll explain again later. Um, but Java, or, um, Perl itself uh, allows you to build the exponent directly into the um, code itself. Um, so there we've got, oh, sorry, here's strict. Just to run that, gives us the same thing as the scalars, numeric operators. So I've got um, x is 4, y is 5. And then I'm just going to do each of the operations in order. Um, and there they are. Um, go ahead and verify as you wish, but um, that's going to be what you get. Uh, did I not get the module in here? I did not get the module in here. Sorry about that. All right, so it goes in once, and that should be one and not four. Why did I do that wrong? Right, no, that is correct. Um, because um, it, it, um, four doesn't go into five one time. It uh, has a remainder of four.
And so going into a little bit more on strings. Um, strings you can build in two ways, either with the double quotes, which um, means interpret my string um, to add whatever uh, variables you want to add into it versus the single quotes, which is I literally want you to use what's inside the, the uh, single quotes. Um, so here um, we've got string one, string two. Um, there are a couple of different ways that you can um, put them together. You can use, either use the dot concatenator or you can um, you can just put it inside of a, uh, a a double quote string and then pull in your variable. So let me um, run this. You can take a look at it. Yeah, so um, as, as we can see, the, the top one with the dot concatenator just gives us hello world. The one with the double quotes uh, allows us to substitute our variables in, our variable strings. Then the third one gives us our direct um, literal quote, which I had to add the extra um, new line character to to get us on the next line. Then I've used, um, you can use other um, you can use other routines or functions to change your your strings. Like um, UC gives you an uppercase, LC gives you lowercase, so you can change, see I've changed my case here. Uh, there are other um, things that you can do, like you can get the length, you can reverse the characters. Um, you'll see what those do when you look at the exercises in the book. Um, all right, so we've just done that. So arrays, if you want to have a bunch of variables that are linked together, you get what's called an array, um, or a vector, depending on what language you're using. So, oh, I've got user input, sorry, user input. So variables become much more interesting once you get user input or input from other data sources. So what we've got here is we've got um, just, I'm printing the screen, enter a number, um, and here I'm, I've got a new um, variable called num1, and then I'm pulling from a place called standard input, which is the keyboard. Um, you'll see I'm using it three times. Um, there, there, and there, so when I run this program, I'm gonna have to enter three things, but then what we need to notice is that when we get them, we can then use them as part of the program. So once I enter the first two numbers, it will add them together. Um, and once it, I give it my name, it will enter my name into the program. So let's run this. Okay, so entering a number, um, five, four, so adding them together we get 5 plus 4 equals 9, but this shows a problem with um, using direct keyboard input. So it, can, it saves the, the character turn or the enter key that I entered while using the input. Um, so we need to use what's called chomp over here to get rid of the input or get rid of the enter at the end of our input. So as you can see here, I've chomped and now we no longer have the um, extra Carriage return. Uh, so, next up. So, arrays. Um, so, an array is built like this. It, it's, um, again, you have to say, um, declare that you want it to exist. So, my, and then instead of the dollar sign, it's the at sign. So at name of your array, whatever you want it to be. And then um, for numbers, it becomes um, just like that. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Um, to get the information out of your array, you have to address it like this. So that number at the end 
is the index of the the um, the place within the the array, and most programming languages start counting at zero. So at position zero, you've got one. At position one, you've got two. Position three, you've got uh, sorry. P position zero one, position one two, position two three, position three four, position four five. Um, so when we see the um, information run, we'll first see um, one come up, then we'll see five come up. Um, then what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using some manipulation uh, functions called shift and pop. So shift will move the array over and pop or and shift this one out. So that shift will become first or first will become one and then it will be removed from the front of the um, the array. So then I'm going to use pop to get rid of five. So five will pop off the end of the array and end up in my last um, variable. So then I can use the scalar function to find out how large my array is. And um, we'll see what the new first element is there. And then I'm going to push um, a 6 onto the end of the array. And as a shortcut to find out what the last element of the array is, I'm using this dollar um, hash array notation. So let's, let's just run this and see what happens. So as you can see, first element 1, last element 5. We remove two of the elements, so it's now only three numbers long. The new first element is 2, and then the last element that we just put on there is 6. So that's, that's a raise. There's um, the code again. Um, what you can do if you're using strings is you can um, use the qw command. And you can just place your strings into um, the parentheses. And it will just um, it'll split your string on each of the spaces that you put in there. So each, each everything between the spaces becomes the new um, the new elements of the array. So then it's 2D arrays next. And a 2D array is an array and a, of arrays within um, how Perl does things. Um, so to access the, the table or the matrix as, as we now have, we have to have two indexes. First, we've got the the rows or which um, element within the original array it is, and then we've got the sub or the element within the subarray. So that would be here, and then two is zero one two, and then zero one two, and so two two is there. Um, this will be explained a little bit better later, um, but let's go see the code. Um, so here we've got our 2D array um, set up. Um, we've got printing the first and the end conditions. If we were to try and get three here, it's going to yell at the program will crash, and it will say that we're trying to access something out of bounds. Um, this is that code again to print it. But then I wanted to show how we can modify the arrays within arrays. So push is one that I didn't show on the, out the last one. Oh, no, I did show it. Um, so we can push Superman onto the zero subarray, so it becomes Clark Kent Superman. Um, then since we don't want Batman in uh, Metropolis, we can get rid of Bruce Wayne. And then we can print off what's in the people array. Um, so then we re restate the array, and, and we get the information again there. I probably need to remove that, because that doesn't make a lot of sense. But here we go. Um, so prints our uh, 2D array, um, prints our modified array, um, and then gives us our top left and bottom right. OK.
And that ends the first session practice. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, and I will get the other or the next couple of sessions up as soon as I can. All right, thank you. Have a good day.